And here we are. Welcome back to the Red Shirt Sophomore Podcast. Um, thanks for stopping in. But just know we never sit out. I'm your host, Matthew Dawson. Joined today, I am with the co-host, as usual, and brother, Christopher C. D. Dawson. And we have another special guest today. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see that we have another special guest. Welcome, Papa Dawson, into the podcast. Massive Alabama fan. Uh, Papa Dawson, would you like to explain just uh, your story of college fandom? Well, yeah, born and raised in the uh, state of Alabama. And I think anyone who knows college football knows what that state is all about <clears throat> in terms there are no there are no professional teams of any magnitude in that state. So Alabama Auburn basically becomes the lives of uh, everyone in that state. And when you are born, you are forced to choose. And I was, um, as I always say, I was, um, you know, Alabama by birth and uh, Crimson Tide by the grace of God. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. For uh, Alabama fans. And so I grew up as an Alabama fan, which is about two thirds of the state. It, it's about a, a, a 60, 40, 66, 33 sort of split. Uh, but yeah, you bleed crimson um, or or that other color in the state of Alabama. So uh, I and also I was thinking the other day, I'm 50 four years old. I've been fortunate enough to have probably 40 years of my life has been a part of two of the, probably the greatest coaching dynasties in the history of college football. And I've been the beneficiary of that. And there was another decade in there where we were also, uh, you know, perennial uh, challengers for a national championship. Of course, I'm talking about uh, the Gene Stallings era. So just be extremely fortunate. Uh, and But as a result of that, I'm just a huge college football fan in general. And we yep. So, that. yeah, for the viewers listening as well, CD and I, yes, we bled crimson. Now we both bleed maroon, but we bled crimson as kids. Um, and, of course, that was a huge inspiration for, like, just getting into college football, just an opportunity to, like, see your team, like, just – win and win and win and win and getting to see how they did it over and over again um as a kid i mean cd just was all in recruit you could talk to him about recruiting at nine years old um in terms of like alabama football so definitely a huge uh inspiration for what we got going here what, what did you say to that christopher yeah one of my original favorite players was philip sims and he was a <laughs> at bama and it was he didn't even start. It was because he was a recruiting guy, and I I didn't follow that heavily, like back then, you know, deep dive into message boards and whatnot. But I just like I heard of him, I attached to him, and then obviously AJ McCarron won the title, probably for the best for Bama fans all around. But yeah, we we've been we were, we weren't quite born and raised in Alabama, but we were born and raised an Alabama fan, and that uh that changes everything, you know. And I and I also tell all of you uh, listeners out there that yeah they've got the headphones on now and they brought the mic in and they you know they've they've, they've uh, formalized this in the in the form of a podcast but what you're basically listening into is every dinner conversation that i uh, have been a part of for the last probably decade uh every thanksgiving dinner every family gathering every casual sit around a fire on the patio like th this is you're just listening in on that i will tell you this is what these guys talk about all day long Mom makes a good beef stroganoff. I'll tell you that. So, anyways, <laughs> let's get into it. We're gonna just quick updates on some recruiting news, some big recruiting news, especially oh, state of Florida is going crazy right now. CD, you want to take the leads on the recruiting news right now? Yeah, I'll say Florida, you know, the University of Florida, right? Billy Napier's Gators, a guy who we knocked a little bit in our previous segment about second year coaches, especially recruiting wise. We, you know, we we were like, we believe in him, but it's yet to be seen and close the deal. What he's done recently has been awesome. In the last three days, by the way. Yeah. It's been three days. It's been three days. I mean, they, they're up to, I believe, the number two recruiting class in the country for Florida, which is where they belong. I'm sorry. If you're in the heart of the Southeast, where talent-wise is Florida and Georgia right next to you, how are you not up there every year? This is what the expectation is when they hired Billy Napier. I think last year you saw it a little bit, but obviously the Jaden Rashad kind of took a step down from everything. But yeah, this is this is awesome. I mean, we'll see what happens on the field. 
uh, you know, they might not even make a bowl game, but they'll be right up there in the, t- the top classes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I famously took Jake Dickert over Billy Napier in our coaches draft. And, you know, the reason for that was, in my eyes, it feels like there's still an expiration date. Now, if he lands the number two, number three, number one recruiting class in the country this year, does that reset his timer on the clock, right? Let's say he goes this year, doesn't make a bowl game, and the year after he doesn't make a bowl game, right? Is he still having a job because of this recruiting class if it ends up where it is at right now? Do we think that? You want this? Well, I think he needs to follow it up. He can't have the you know top three, four recruiting class this year and then be bad for two years unless the two recruiting classes that follow this one are also rich with talent. I mean, it's very similar to the Jimbo scenario that's going on at Texas A&M right now. Everybody's looking for that class from a year ago to come to fruition. And if people are thinking about that in the context of Billy Napier, I think you'll get extra time. But again, not if the next two recruiting classes after that or the one after that is the the 13th or 15th. Because to your point, there's no reason that the University of Florida should not have a top uh, recruiting class every single year, especially with Miami. Yes, Cristobal can really, really recruit, but Miami is a little bit down. Um, you know, Florida State's been down for some time. Obviously, there's a lot of optimism this coming season, but it's not the old dynamic of Miami, Florida, Florida State that used to exist where they had to divide the talent three ways. You know, that that, that dynamic's not there. He should be winning uh, these battle, these recruiting battles. Yeah, and he has. How about uh, four four-star recruits on Saturday? And then today, another two three-stars. You're like, okay, that bumped him up to number five overall. And then he just landed in the last hour of recording this, two hours, five-star edge to Monta Waller. I mean, that's crazy. That bumps him up to the number two recruiting class in the country. I think they're fourth overall in player average. Um, That's crazy. That's crazy. So good for him. I mean, I'm rooting for Billy Napier. So, yes, I didn't draft him. <laughs> Whoops. I mean, I guess – Sorry, I'm rooting for Washington State, too. All right, let's relax there. But I, I definitely – I'm excited to see this. Very, very, very talented recruiting class he's got going so far. Just, I mean, it won't translate this year, obviously, because it's 2024. But, man, but, yeah. I mean, other recruiting news, right? Texas, nice four-star receiver. Any comments on that, Christopher? I'm afraid to Bose Jr. I know a and wanted him, too, right? Uh, a lot of teams wanted him, obviously. Four star receiver. You can't have too many of those guys, especially in a Texas offense. Right. Uh, and realistically, I think he'd be ranked higher, right? Has injury concerns in high school. I think he'd be actually ranked higher. So I think I think Texas kind of got a gem there. I know like some teams like pulled back their leash a little bit because they were concerned about the injury, but I I think he's a really, really talented player. I would have liked to see him at Texas AM. I know AM fans are gonna try to uh cope and say, Oh, we didn't want him. Yeah, okay, maybe injury concerns. Oh, injury concerns. Okay, yeah, but like the talent is there. I, I think he could be really good. Kevin Riley, four star running back from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Bama, I know one of them really, really bad, really, really bad. Kevin Riley ends up going to Miami, follows Cristobal. Um, I think that's a big, big win for them. Big, big win for them. They need they need to start stacking those for sure, and I think they will. Well, we we've seen this happen, right? We saw it happen with Texas A and M. It's happened with Alabama historically. It's happened to Georgia. It's very, very hard to do back-to-back top recruiting classes because you know as an incoming athlete that you're competing. Again, you are one year behind the top recruiting class in the country from a year ago. And that's why it's that's why you can see someone from Tuscaloosa getting away to Miami for pretty easily. Obviously, Cristobal with their recruiting roots from his time in Alabama already. Well, yeah, you look at, I mean, just at Bama in general, Richard Young and Justice Haynes already come in there. We know Justice Haynes is going to be a guy for three years there, at least. Richard Young, they know they're really high on as well. Uh, and But also recruiting nowadays is national. I don't, at a program like Alabama, they miss out on a guy from Al, in the state of Alabama. It happens every year. They're not going to lock down the borders anymore. It's different nowadays. Uh, I, I don't think, I think it's good, good for Miami. I don't think Bama's, I know they wanted them, but I think they'll be fine. Yeah, and there's no question they'll be fine. Just I, I think it's it's just nice to see that kind of momentum from Miami over there. How about well Arizona three commits today? Can't forget about them, man. Can't, Can't forget. forget about the Pac-12. Can't forget about the Pac-12. And speaking of the Pac-12, Stanford, CD, Stanford right now. 
What? I Troy him. Taylor? Are you serious? First of all, I love him as a coach. What's going on over there? What is going on over there in Stanford? Well, we saw Elijah Brown was Elijah Brown, the head, the headliner, modern day as quarterback, the guy that followed Bryce Young after Bryce Young left there. Elijah Brown's been the guy there since uh, since after the Bryce Young days, and he's been awesome for him. They play a tough schedule. You know those modern day quarterbacks are going to be well adjusted to the modern college football and Power Five. Uh, and they also got an offensive lineman that's pretty high rated three star. They're up to ninth in their class which is awesome to see. Stanford's always had that ability to recruit well. Um, just because, like, a certain type of kid is able to, like, put them at the top of their list just because of academics in general, but also with that new coaching staff. They're never going to be up there at, at one, and they might not finish the class in the top ten. They, they won't. Got... <laughs> Spoiler, they won't. But they, they got I, – I love that. I love that for them. I do too. And I think the Pac-12 is better. I think the Pac-12 needs Stanford to be good, right? I think they need to be good. UCLA, USC believing. I think they they need Stanford to be good. And I really like Troy Taylor. I think, oh man, he wins everywhere. He wins everywhere. Now he hasn't won at the D1 level yet. But I, I'm really interested to see some of those offenses that he's got cooking up there. Um, yeah, but the big recruiting news that I wanted to talk about today that we kind of hinted at in the last episode, Austin Simmons. 2025 four-star quarterback from the state of Florida, was committed to Florida, flipped to Ole Miss. But that's not the kicker, right? The kicker is that he reclassified two years. He's a sophomore in high school. He reclassified to 2023. So he will be at Ole Miss this fall at barely 17 years old. That is pretty crazy. I I haven't heard a lot of stories like that. So what are you guys thinking right there? Wow. Um, you know, you're starting to see it a little bit. It's it's trickled into basketball. Uh, we've seen a couple of instances of that where people recalibrate by a year, right? Basketball, though, the body, the physical stature and, and where your body needs to be from a developmental standpoint to play at an elite level in basketball is not the same as football. And I think this is really going to be a ch- I, I don't I, I think that, that this, this this kid's making a bit of a mistake. Um by depriving himself of, of a junior and senior year in high school. I mean, you guys played high school football. I mean, how much fun did you, that just some of the greatest memories of your life. Right. And instead of doing that and experiencing junior senior year in high school and and all of that comes with that and the Friday night lights and the wearing the Jersey down the halls and on Fridays, instead of doing that, he's going to be basically sitting the bench um, and, and in practice going up against, full grown men um, in, in practices. And I, I just think it's, it's a very dangerous and slippery slope. I know I tend to be a bit old school. Um, you know, I'm not a fan of NIL, at least not the way it's currently constituted. I'm not a fan of the transfer rules, at least not the way they're currently constituted. So I, I get accused of being a little bit old school, but th- there just seems like there's a lot of things potentially wrong with this. And I, I know recruiting is getting younger and younger. By the way, this is not a new phenomenon. One of the most interesting stories I've ever heard was that Cornelius Bennett, everybody remembers him, uh, NFL linebacker, played for the Bills, one of the top tier NFL linebackers for some time, great Alabama player. Bear Bryant was writing him letters when he was in seventh and eighth grade. Um, Recruiting younger kids is not, it's not new, but this seems to me like this is, this is stepping into some pretty dangerous territory that I, um, I don't necessarily, I'm not a fan of. Yeah. Right. I'll say this. I I didn't really think about it from like a father's perspective, like you brought up here, where like you're missing his junior and senior year. I think it's a great point. I'll stick to strictly football. Uh, I think he got fed bad information. Someone is misleading him in his camp or from old Mrs. Camp. And to be honest, I I cannot help but hold Lane Kiffin accountable to this. I I typically like to defend Lane Kiffin because I know he's a little bit out there and I respect him the way he wins. I know you're shaking your head. I know you don't love Lane Kiffin. But he's hilarious. He's a great Twitter follow. He's by good the way. for college football. He's he great really for college is. football. But I, I cannot help but thinking as a, he's a father himself, he needs to know better and that he should have told this guy, listen, you need to wait a couple of years. This is the right thing for you. And I get it. He probably wanted to. And I know it's hard to turn down a talent like that because he is a highly ranked guy from two years from now. But also, and I don't doubt that he's not going to get – exponentially better in the two years he's going to be at florida versus the two years he'd be in high school he will get exponentially better practicing in florida there's no doubt about it the problem is is his clock starts now his clock literally starts now instead of in two years from now so yes in these two years he can develop a lot 
but then he only has two or three years left remaining. He's you know? not going to get a fifth COVID year. That, that, no. That's done. No, and so I, I don't know. I I hope it works out for him, but I, to be honest, I don't. And it's not like a case of Leonard Fournette. Leonard Fournette could have walked down at LSU as a junior in high school, and he would have been unbelievable. He could have walked into the NFL after his senior year in high school, and he would have been a first-round pick too. The problem is, is this is not that guy. This guy still needs some time. This is two years, okay? Uh, I don't know. Don't like it. Hope it works out for him, though. No. Yep, I get it. I, so you just gotta say, I'm gonna play a little bit of devil's advocate here, just to like see the other side of that, right? So this kid, he was homeschooled his entire life up until high school, right? So that's why he was able to get ahead on the curriculum. Graduated early. He's been playing starting quarterback for them since eighth grade. So he's been the starting quarterback there for three years. He's six two, one eighty five. So he's actually, he's not very small, right? And he's got a lot, he could have, he has time to fill that out, right? He's not going to start. They have three quarterbacks there. I mean, he's not going to start for a couple of years. It's very clear. They're bringing him in as an investment, right? I. So I think reclassifying to the class of 2023 may be a mistake down the road, but I don't, he's he's highly talented. He's a highly talented baseball player, being recruited for baseball as well. So this is not just a football decision either, right? He's going there to play baseball as well. And at 17, Right. I mean, we see 17 year olds go to the minors all the time. I mean, he will be a good baseball player for Ole Miss at 17 years old. Right. He's kidding like 350s, uh, sophomore year in high school. I mean, that now is his third year starting on the varsity team. So I, I think I think he's pretty good. He's a really smart kid, graduated with a five three seven GPA, right? So the classwork is not gonna be a problem to him. College life. What? I'm just gonna say well, whole- high school. In okay. high, his high school GPA in the high school was five. Okay, I, okay, that that's a little different. Okay, when yep, mom- yep. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, he was he basically graduated high school, essentially. Like most of his high classes were taken at homeschool, like when he was in middle school. But then in high school, he, he he's taken like seventeen college classes since he's been in high school. He's taken a lot of college curriculum, so I think like college life will be a little bit difficult, right? There's a maturity thing right there that you know you just. 17 versus 19 doesn't feel like a big difference, but definitely can be, right? So I, I, context too. You you have, and we see this all the time. Again, this is the father perspective. This is the old school school's perspective, but you see 20, 21, 22 year old kids making very bad decisions because they they are they still lack the maturity to um you know to to in some cases to exist in certain ways in society and make the right decisions. We saw Jalen Carter, we we've seen so many instances of that. And now you've accelerated that even to a, a, a junior in high school. And I just think that there's a there's a maturity level, there's a social maturity level, there's an emotional maturity level. It's not even just about the physical, if you ask me. I think you're you're starting to ask an awful lot out of a 17-year-old kid. And I think that's an unfair thing to ask of him. And I, and I honestly I got you can call out Lane Kiff and I call out the parents. Um, because I I just don't think I would have allowed that to happen. I, I really don't. Yep, I can see that. I think from a football perspective, I think Ole Miss is going to be happy about this. I think they're going to get their chance to get their hands on them early, which to them is a good thing, right? But, you know, for the kid, who knows? Uh, good luck to Austin Simmons, though. I, I think he could be pretty decent. He actually broke Anquan Bolden's uh, passing touchdown. Uh, and passing yard record in high school from that same high school. Because Anquan, Anquan Bolden was a high quarterback in uh, high school. So, I mean, it could be pretty good. It could be pretty good. So, all right. Anyways, let's move on to the actual event of the hour. So, CD is going to take over rapid fire segment. Going to ask the, the big Bama fan some some questions. Rapid fire. We've done these segments before. 30 seconds to answer each question. And then we're going to play a little trivia game. Alabama trivia. So, Fantastic CD. You want to take a lead on this one? Yes. For uh for dad here, what I'll what I'll be doing here is I'll read off a question to you. This will be your opinion. It will be Alabama related, typically within the Saban era, just because that's more relatable to us as Matthew and I, uh, but also as our fans typically. Uh, and that's what we're all interested in too, because otherwise it'd be too expansive and all this stuff. But all right, so I'm gonna get going. You'll have about 30 seconds to to answer your question, state your case, and uh We'll go from there. All right. The, fir- the first question is, who's your favorite offensive coordinator from Alabama Saban era? It's close between the uh, the, the former USC uh, prodigal sons, right? It's uh, Lane Kiffin and, and Sarkeesian. 
I'm going to go with Sarkeesian because I just believe he was brilliant. Um, I mean, what obviously he had some tremendous talent to work with, but that team from 2020, as good as and as talented as they were, man, they were just, they, it was, they were playing chess and everybody else was playing checkers in terms of the schemes and, and, um, and what he did with that talent. So, and I do, I'm a little bit of a fan of the recovery story. I think Sarkeesian, I think he's a new person. I think he's a different person now than he was when he exited USC and he had his problems in, in some of the Pac, uh, Pac-12 areas. And, and by the way, I, I, I think he is thankful to Nick Saban for that. And I think he's been pretty open about that. It's Sarkeesian for emotional and uh, winning reasons. Don't hate that at all. We all love the, the RPO era of 2020 that, that was Matt Jones in them. I will mention Steve Sarkeesian at Texas has an assistant coach or had an assistant coach that had a stripper girlfriend with a monkey whose name was Polo Assassin. So I'm just going to leave that there. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently he likes to he rehabilitate as well. Yeah. Yeah, I know. He's a good guy. He's a good guy. Awesome. He's an awesome guy. <laughs> uh, all right. Now the defensive coordinator. Oh, well, it's got to be Kirby Smart. I mean, where would I – could I go anywhere else? I mean, if Kirby doesn't leave Bama, I mean, there, there's so many ifs in college football and whatever, but he doesn't leave Alabama. Who knows what what sort of, uh, you know, destiny they would be on. Uh, I just really, really like his passion, too. I, he seems to relate well to players, and that's all translating now to the success that he's having as a head coach. I mean, think about how good – think about what that coaching room had to have been like when you had Saban and you had Kirby Smart, who basically is, you know, now arguably the best coach in college football. And you've actually right now. <laughs> oh <laughs> boy. Has the best program has the best program. We had that discussion the other day. So I, you got to go Kirby Smart. I don't think it's even close. I don't hate that at all. Okay. This one was not one of my questions, but I'll give you about a couple sentences to say your case. Who is your least favorite defense coordinator, and why is it Pete Golding? <laughs> you know my answer because you know me so well. Listen, something was wrong. Um, something was fundamentally wrong with that defense over the last two years. The talent they poured into the uh, NFL, the talent, the four and five stars that they've had in and out of there. Will Anderson, arguably, um, you know, the, the most impactful defensive presence in the history of Alabama sports, going back. Maybe you have to go back to Derek Thomas. And for them to not only not be good, they were terrible. They got lit up in big against games, Tennessee in sure. big game. And the lack of adjustment. I mean, how many times do you have to watch the same player run wide open on Tennessee and you don't make an adjustment? I I don't know what it is about him that Saban loved, but uh, I didn't see it. And most Alabama fans didn't see it. Yeah, and for you, Arkansas – Oregon State, whatever fans out there, when Papa Doss says, oh, they were terrible, right? He's speaking in obvious relative terms, right? Yes. <laughs> His idea of terrible being an Alabama fan for 40 years is a lot different than uh, I think uh, you and I's. So, fair. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. If you're a fan of Alex Grinch, yeah, I can't eat. I don't know. No, I'm not, I'm not going to say it, but poor yeah, Oklahoma. I, yeah. All right. Uh, give me your take real quick on the new coordinators that they have they've hired there do you believe that there are upgrades in the over the past two ones um i i think kevin Steele is an upgrade as i just i just did my diatribe on uh pete golding i don't need to redo it i think Steele brings an intensity defense um, coordinator by the way the kevin defense coordinator, kevin, he brings an intensity that they've been lacking they will be aggressive from everything i've heard they will blitz he will simplify that defense a little bit so people can just uh, – players can just react and be as opposed to having to think too much. But I think might have been a little bit of a problem in the golden era. I think the jury's going to be out on Tommy Reese. Um, I did not think that Bill O'Brien was a fundamental problem. I mean, if you look – the problem was not on the offensive side of the ball the last couple of years. They didn't have the wide receiver talent that Sarkeesian and Kiffin and some others had in the past. <laughs> so I was not really a Bill O'Brien hater. Still hate the Texas A&M call. On, uh, on the goal line, which uh, we were all there for that. I, I still am angry about that. But uh, I, I will say this, and I, I told you guys this, Greg McElroy, I thought had a great quote on their morning show on Jocks FM in Birmingham. And when he said, um, if you build your team around a quarterback, you will be soft. 
And, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. And I think that for better or worse, what Alabama has had and what they've been blessed with the last five years is a very different style of really team overall, team overall. And I think this, Tommy Reese might be the right coordinator for this moment in time when we don't have a Tua, we don't have a Bryce Young and it, 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 he might be the right person for that this moment in time. We'll see. I'm certainly hopeful. Yeah, I, real quick, I think he's just going to be a better recruiter than Bill O'Brien was. I, I don't know how great he was. I know he was a good head coach at Penn State, and they actually recruited well with him. But I don't believe he was fully invested in recruiting, as he knew he was likely this is a stepping stone job to either a head coaching job somewhere else or back to the NFL, yeah. which he ended up going. I think he's an NFL guy. Personally, but, but again, no, he was terrible as, as a GM, as, as a, a GM. GM, he's not it's a bad good. coach. He's actually not a bad coach, which I guess you don't want a bad GM being your recruiter. So yeah. I, anyways, uh, what's your favorite win or the most important win that Saban has had at Bama? I think you have to go back to Florida when they beat Tim Tebow in the SEC championship game uh, in Saban's what third year? I think it was. It was the second year they played Florida. The first year they played for in the SEC title game. They had 2009. A, yeah, they had a lead in the third quarter and and just couldn't finish it off. But that that there that was just a a symbol of the changing of the guard. It was you know you could make all kinds of comments that that ran Urban Meyer out of Florida because he knew he was never going to beat Saban. I mean I know you can you can get on the anti-Urban track pretty quickly if you want for a lot of reasons, but I think that was that was the changing of the guard. That was the statement that Bama is back. We have arrived. We are here. We have the talent, and and here we go again. And and I think that to me is the is the win for me that turned it. I agree. I couldn't agree more. I think that was it. Um, over under two and a half years until another national title. Two and a half years. So this year, this year, and or next year. year. Yep. Sure, yeah, sure. I, I, I take. I will take the under, and there's two reasons oh, for oh, this. Oh, um, oh. Let's one, keep our receipts. Let's keep our receipts. Well, one, you've got last year's recruiting class, elite. Um, and the year you know, before, and, yeah. and the year before. So, I in fact, last year's recruiting class, you know, the, the the best recruiting class you can argue maybe in history of recruiting. So, you know, they will develop that talent. That that. So, I I believe that. The other thing I believe about, I don't think this year is out of the question. And I know I'm very much in the minority on this, but the the history of what Saban has done in terms of the expectations to win versus actually delivering on the field with the actual national championship. He does some of his best coaching and he has some of his best seasons when he's not necessarily supposed to be the team. And I, I think this will be really interesting. You know, he's ticked off, you know, the talk about Kirby smart being the, the having the program and being the coach, you know, that bothers him. You know it bothers the players, by the way. People who come to Alabama come to win national championships. They don't come there. You, know, you could talk about NIL. You could talk about all the other stuff, right? They come there to win national championships. And I think there's uh, there's going to be a, 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 a something permeating that locker room, and I've even begun to, to hear rumblings of it right now. The leadership is stronger. They're, they're, it, it, I wouldn't be surprised either the next two years if they walk off with the whole thing. Yeah, I, that just – it blows my mind why they underachieved so badly the past two years with Bryce Young and Will Anderson, who are, in my opinion, really, really good leaders. They are, yeah. And that – but leadership was the question. Was it the coaches? Was it, you know, the rest of the players? Uh, who knows? But I, I think they kind of – it's a different band of team than it was last year. Uh, so we'll see. All right, last one. Give me your dream scenario and then your realistic scenario of Saban's replacement. We'll start with dream. Wow. Well, well, the dream, I mean, you know, three or four years ago, any Alabama fan would have told you it was going to be Dabo Sweeney and regardless of whatever came out of um, Dabo's mouth and whatever he said or didn't say, Dabo Sweeney grew up in Birmingham. He grew up an Alabama fan, lifelong fan. He lived under the Bear Bryant era. He coached under Stallings. He won a national championship. There was an off week uh, at Clemson one year. He went back. Uh, and I believe they scheduled the off week because I think it was done this way intentionally. He went back and well, Bama did. Bama did it intentionally did so it they could to, get him. To, so they could get him. And then, um, you know, he actually went back and was on the sidelines to celebrate the '92 team. Um, so I think you know 
just knowing that Dabo wants that, he wants that, um, he wants that statue, um, you know, on uh, outside of Brian Thingy Stadium. But I don't know, some of the more, he hasn't adjusted well to the NIL or the, um, uh, or the transfer rules particularly well. Um, I, I think Alabama fans right now have, have, have maybe sort of faded a little bit on that. So in terms of I dream scenario, I don't think Bama fans have one right now. I really don't think they have um, this person that they've locked into. Um, you know, you, you could say all you want about the rumors of Lane Kiffin stated there so that he could take the alley. I don't think Lane Kiffin would be a good fit at Alabama. The culture would not be there. I'm a, I'm a Kiffin fan. Wouldn't happen. Um, I don't think we know. And I don't think whoever it is, is on the current Alabama staff. Um, that's not a knock on any of those individuals. Uh, is it going to have to come from the Saban tree? You're going to have all those conversations. But uh, as an Alabama fan, I'm hoping not to have those conversations for a while. Because I know I've told you guys this before. Uh, I've seen it. I've seen the replacement of Stallings. I saw the replacement of Bryant. Uh, we've seen this before. The toughest job is going to be the one that comes right after the job you really want is the person who replaces the person who replaces uh, Saban. So I think we're going to, you know, like any program, I, I suspect we're going to probably have a couple of tough years before we land our next great head coach, but hopefully we've got a while. Which is crazy because you will have your pick of just about anybody you want. Now, I don't know. I think nowadays it's better than it has been, but the athletic staff and the boosters and the higher ups. I don't know if I trust them quite as much to get that right decision. I mean, they wanted to hire Rich Rodriguez for a while, and yeah, no, no, no hate to him at all. But I mean, he would have been fired four years later. Like that's yeah, it's different. Different. I mean, you know, who knows who the AD is going to be? Um, you know, Greg Byrne's a very good AD. Greg Byrne would control that hire uh, if it were to happen under his tenure. So. Um, you know, I don't, it's, it's, and it's going to have to be a different person because college football is so different now than it was only two or three years ago. You got 17 year old kids coming in to play high school football. And now you've got all the other things going on. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure it can be someone in the same mold of a Saban or a Bear Bryant because those two were actually very, very similar personalities and very, very similar in terms of, um, really how they ran their teams and how they, how they worked with players, very similar personality. Then you're going to need a different, different type of cat. All right. Uh, good answer. I think, uh, I think listeners are going to feel a little more informed, a little more informed. And also uh, they might have a little bit more confidence in you now with our trivia game, Alabama, <laughs> Nick Saban era trivia. I'm terrible got- at trivia, but let's do it. We got 10 questions. They're three points each. If you ask for a hint, it deducts one point. So if you ask for one hint, you can only get a maximum of two points if you get it right. If you ask for a second hint, you can only get one point. If you miss after two guesses, then CD gets a chance to steal that question for three points, no matter how many hints that there are. So maximum that you can get is 30 points. Minimum you can get is obviously zero. And, uh, well, knowing CD, I think he's going to get a lot of these. So, uh, just uh, just be careful over there. So, take your hints. I'm gonna start off easy though. First question: Nick Saban era. Who is Alabama's all-time leading passer with over nine thousand passing yards? Uh, is that Bryce? Uh, is that Bryce Young? Your first guess is incorrect. Well, you, so, you know who it is. Well, you, you gotta say it. No, you, well, you get another guess. You oh, get two. you get you get two, two guesses. That's two. That is. Incorrect. Buzz, 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 buzz. Buzz, 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 buzz. Give me AJ McCarron. AJ McCarron is the correct answer. Actually, Bryce Young is second all-time passing yards leaders, and Tua actually leads all-time in touchdown um, leaders. So, yeah, so Tua and Tua. Tua played one and a half years. Bryce Young played two years. And while he was successful, to be honest, uh, Tua would have been my first pick. Um, But then McCarron was... uh, Wow. The obvious chance. All right. Choice all right. All right. So I'm, I'm I'm bad so far. Let's go. Bad so far, but uh, all no, right. Wait, it's my favorite quarterback of the Saban era. So it, it's kind Mobile of native. Mobile. Mobile native. So went to a that was my that was my hint. If you would ask for a hint, I, I didn't even make a second hint because I knew that you would get that. <laughs> so all right. Question number two. 
in the first game of the 2012 season, season that ultimately led to a national championship against Notre Dame, Alabama opened with this Big Ten team winning 41 to 14. Oh, I got to think back. Oh, uh, they've yeah. opened with Michigan. They've opened with Wisconsin. I, I believe that was the Michigan year. Very good. Ding, ding, ding. That is correct. Uh, that team finished eight and five, and Brady Hook was fired two years later. So Alabama, if you if you want to open against Alabama, you better be prepared to have a coaching search not long after that because the, the track record's not very good for teams that open against Alabama. Jimbo Fisher and Florida State. Yikes. Uh, well, he good. went and got a better job. So that's <laughs> that's I don't know if that's a loss Clemson, necessarily. Who, who, Clemson's coach when Alabama gave them the beat down. It ironically was, uh, it led to Dabo it Sweeney. It led to Dabo Sweeney, but yeah, it's just this. Yeah, it just is what it is. Yep. All right, so score's tied, 3-3. Three to three. So, a reminder, you do have hints. I don't think you're going to need a hint here. I don't really have hints. I'd have to, based on the nature of the question, you'll see why. But uh, So, question number three, name every starting quarterback to start and win a national championship under Saban. To start the game? That they won the national championship to or start to- and finish the game and win the game. Well, you got Matt Nixon. Roy. You've got McCarron twice. That's two. That's uh, twice. Yep. Um, uh, you've obviously got Mac Jones. Uh, yep. Poker. That's and- it. You got him. Yep. Nailed it. All right. That was that was pretty flawless right there. So other quarterbacks and saving national championship teams. Well, that would obviously be Jalen Hurts as a starter and then Tua finishing it. Yep. So that's why the the nature of that question, try to word it as good as possible. But uh, yeah. So anyways, that's six points for you. Has not used a hint yet. Um, Pretty interesting. All right. Here's an interesting one, I think. I think. Because I don't think there's any way to like actually like know this unless you like, you know, look it up. But aside from the 2007 season, in Nick Saban's first year, right, when they went 7-6, and six, how many times has Nick Saban's Alabama team finished outside the top 10 in the AP poll? Wow. Finished the season, so after bowl games, right? So how many yep. times has that happened other than the first year? I the only possible scenario they have had a couple of two lost teams, um, with the second loss being the bowl game and the second loss being somewhat embarrassing fashion. So I think I'm gonna I'm actually gonna go with the team that followed the national championship year. So that would be 2010, right? I may have the year wrong, but that's yep. the year where they lost to LSU, South Carolina, and then got spanked by Utah. Yep, um, correct. Um, and Auburn. Yeah, and, that no, was, Utah was no, they 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 killed Michigan State in that bowl. Game. Remember, they were dragging oh, yeah. out fifth string quarterbacks in the Capital One Bowl. But I believe because, because they had those those losses in the regular season, I'm I'm thinking that might have pushed them out of the top ten. That might be um, the end there. So is one uh, your final or first answer? That's my first answer. Yeah. Uh, eh, incorrect. And then my oh. second answer is going to be zero. Ding, ding, ding. Zero times Nick oh, Saban has finished outside the top 10 in the AP poll since 2007. Now, he's finished outside the top 10 in the coaches' poll. One time he finished 11th in that same season you were talking about in 2010. That's a travesty. I'm sorry. What? Well, if you remember, they were ranked 16th against Michigan State, who was ranked like number eight or nine at the time. And they – did them in that bowl game, the Capital One, and it propelled them to exactly 10 in the AP poll. That was an angry Alabama team that showed up in that bowl game. By the way, I'm drawing a comparison to this year's team that took it out on Kansas State, a team that won the Big 12, and they actually had no chance in that game against Alabama. That's why I am feeling like what happened after that Michigan State that uh, humiliate uh, he, when they humiliated Michigan State they went on to win the national championship the next year, and I I think that you could that's why I think that they this year's not out of the question. I would have said three. That would have been my number. Two thousand eight after they lost to Florida and then Utah. 
Uh, I would have said 2010, like Dad said, and then I would have said at 2014 when they lost to Auburn and then Oklahoma. Yeah, they were the number one. They lost to Florida, though, and that they were the number one team. People forget that. They were one. Florida was two. Yeah, but two losses, though, in a row, that'll do it. So that could kick you out of the top ten. I, I don't know. I just – I mean, they're – I'll tell you, they finished sixth in the AP poll that year. After losing to Utah? Yep. I get it. I get it. That was – was that Alex Smith, right? Uh, No, it was actually uh, – 2005. That was with the fire. It was the other, there was a, the quarterback there was a stud though. Yeah, he was a stud. He was on the cover of NCAA uh, eight ten ten. Yeah, you're yep, you're so right. Yeah, you. Yeah, that was not Alex. Alex Smith was years years earlier. So yeah, so Papa Doss has nine points right now. CD has three. Um, I think this is an interesting question because there's a lot of options. So and uh. I don't know how much. I mean, it's an interesting question because there's a lot of answers. I'm going to take one out of the answer, take an answer out here for you, though. So CJ Mosley is the leading career tackler in the Nick Saban tackler in the Nick Saban era with 319 tackles. That's a lot. However, the most he ever had in the season was 107. This linebacker leads the Nick Saban era at Alabama in tackles in a single season with 115 tackles. Who is this linebacker for Alabama? I think I know this one. I'm not gonna lie. I I I have a good guess, but I I'm not confident enough in it. So I'm gonna ask for a hint. That's the right play there. Because if you miss, I'm st- uh. I don't know how how helpful. Okay, I think it is helpful. Okay, he was a first round draft pick, but he was a late first round draft pick. Late. Very late. Oh, the linebacker that was drafted by San Francisco. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, oh he was, was a he was a top. Oh, five. he had some behavior issues. Yeah, he had some uh, serious issues, and then ended up not uh, amounting to anything. I am I am surprised it's him. But and you know what? Honestly, I, I um, five star recruit from Auburn High School. Yeah, he had Auburn tattooed on his arm, and then he uh, flipped his commit. Uh, I think you're thinking of. Uh... Cyrus Quanjo or Cam no, Robinson? Cam no, Robinson. No, no. no, this was this was this guy. No, oh, really? uh, oh why am I um same high school as Red uh Rashawn Evans, too. Yeah. Both um, five star linebackers. I, I I'm blanking on his name. Honestly, it, 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 okay. It, well, well he, would you would you like a second hint? Second hint will be a, that, that the second hint will be a, a better one. Yeah, I'll take the second hint. His first name <laughs> is actually <laughs> The name of a sandwich. Name of a sandwich? It's not club. It's not rye. It's not ham. It's not. Uh, oh, CD, Ruben, are you? Uh, Ruben, uh, Ruben Foster. There, yep, it is. there it is. And he gets and one point. Really, he did have uh, an Auburn tattoo. When he committed to Auburn, I believe he got an Auburn tattoo and then he had to decommit. Uh, and then he decommitted came to yeah. Alabama. So did they, they flipped. Uh, Cyrus Quanjo from Auburn, though, too, right? Yeah, well, Cyrus Quanjo like signed with Auburn. Like he he committed on live TV, right? It was yeah, he Auburn. never signed. Yeah, he just signed. But then he didn't sign. And then later that day, he just changed his mind. Yeah. And by yeah. the way, Rolando McLean was going to be my my uh, my top pick, but I thought that was too much too obvious. So that's why I mine agree. would have been R- Reggie Ragland, who's my favorite linebacker that Bama's had. Even though you wore Mosley's number. Yeah, well, Mosley and Rashawn Evans. But 19 would have looked so ugly on me. Some scrawny little <laughs> short kid. Yeah, so I, so that was actually, that was good. I, I'm actually very surprised. I did not know that he was the single. Is that what you would have said first, Christopher? I would have said Reggie Ragland. Oh, you would have said Reggie. Okay, you said that. You said I would have actually said Mosley. I would have said Mosley, but you took him out, and then otherwise I would have said McLean. Yeah, so he he was actually second um, in saving era and single season tackles. So, um, no, like, no, we're on that topic. Bama is a part of some of the greatest commitment videos in high school history with Lana Collins' mom going off and then Jacob Copeland's mom going off and like Juan Joe and Ruben. Like it's the list goes on. Bama's it's the South recruiting is awesome. Back on ESPN, the Under Armour All American, when that was the big deal and they had the original signing day, February 2nd, that was so incredible. Yeah, I agree. So this one. 
I think this is an easy question, but I don't think this is necessarily an easy question because you do have to like think about it a little bit. So Papadoss has 10 points. CD still has three. Snagged that second hint there, which was kind of big. So uh, sixth question. Prior to 2023's draft with Bryce Young and Will Anderson getting drafted one and two back to back, uh, name the next two highest players ever drafted in the Nick Saban era that were both selected at number three overall. Just name one of them. Oh, you only need to name one? In the yep. Saban era. We can do two if, if you guys want to name both. If he doesn't name both of them, I get to steal that one. I'm going to say this, that. This is an interesting one because I'm trying to remember who – I mean, there's been a lot of guys in the top ten, but third? I – oh, man. Any of the – well – was Julio third or no? No, they moved up to get Julio, but he wasn't third. I'm pretty sure Julio was the second wide receiver taken in his draft, if I'm mistaken. And Atlanta traded up to get him, but I don't think it was third. I think AJ Green went right before him, or it was the other way around with Cooper and yeah, Kevin White. But... Um, I mean, I and the running backs just don't go very high. This, this is I'm I'm, I'm going to struggle here, so I'm going to need a hint. <laughs> All right. Your first hint, Dad, is they played on the same national championship team. There was one year overlap where they played on the same national championship team, and they're on different sides of the ball. Uh, okay, you know what? It just occurred to me. Trent Richardson was one of them. That was- is correct. That is correct. He was drafted third, third overall to the Browns. Um, and then on the other side of the ball from that team would – I mean, I want to say McLean, but it could have been McLean or Hightower or McLean was. I'll give you. I'll give you this. McLean was a senior on that 2019, so he would not have overlapped with Trent Richardson's draft class. But here's the thing: was Trent Richardson on that team in 2020 or 2009? Yeah, he was. Trent Richardson. Oh, they were on this. They were on the same team, team. but they weren't in the same draft class. So correct, correct. I don't think McLean went. so, and then I don't think they had an elite secondary guy. Kirkpatrick came later, right? Kirkpatrick was like ninth, ninth round pick or ninth, ninth player taken, something like that. So the other, the other option would have been, oh, um, was it Mark? It could have been Mark Barron. So I, I'm thinking it's either going to be Barron, Kirkpatrick, or Hightower, or McLean or Hightower. I'm going to go McLean. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to throw it out and get McLean. That is incorrect. Incorrect. Uh, McLean, I believe, was 25th overall. Yeah. He was, he was a little bit later. So you get but, to see him, right? You get well, you get one more guess, but uh, you also do have one more hint. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the one more hint because I need to narrow it down here. So the one that you got, uh, the hint was that – well, one of the hints was one was a huge bust in the NFL, right? Huge bust. Um, the other one was actually pretty decent in the NFL. He was drafted to an AFC team, and he did have a first-team All-Pro in 2014. Yeah. Oh, oh, it was uh, is Marcel Darius. Oh, Correct, and he gets it, and he gets it. So, yeah. Um, Wait, what was the question again? Because Quinn and Williams went third overall a couple of years ago. Quinn and Williams did not go third overall. Quinn and Williams went third overall after Nick Bosa, I believe, or Chase Young. I thought Williams was fourth. I thought he was fourth too. Oh yeah, he was third overall pick in 2019. Wow. Right, that, was, that was my mind went to Richardson and Williams when you said. Well, Game master gets one wrong, so I'll give you a point, CD. That was, yeah, that was give, give, give him a point for having. You should, you should have that. <laughs> that was impressive because I didn't even. I thought he was fourth, but I guess he was third. I remember, so, there was a big debate about the second overall. It was was it Nick Bosa in that draft, right? Yes, because one was. Uh, was it Chase Young? It was one of those guys. They, but who cares? Anyways, it was William. Yeah. Williams. Who cares? All right, so. Next question, question seven. In 2016, Jonathan Allen had a marvelous run on the defensive line coming in seventh in the Heisman voting that year, which included 10 and a half sacks, 69 tackles, and 16 tackles for loss. In this year, Allen had a famous 
Superman sack where he leapt over their opponent's single season rushing record holder to acquire a sack against the number six ranked team in the country at the time. Who was that team? Questions are getting a little harder now. Questions are getting a little harder. So if I remember, I, I remember the play because it was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. He took over that game, by the way. I actually think it was LSU. Is that your first guess? That's my first guess. Incorrect. It is not LSU. They were the number six team in the country. They were the number sixth team in the country, 2016. I'm not mistaken, Matthew. This was the game. Well, I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait. I'll wait. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm about to say, I'm about to snag a hint here. Um, Your first hint is this team has beaten Alabama more than once since Saban has taken over. Well, there's been a couple of those, but not many. Um, I'm, I mean, Ole Miss? Say our other guess. Well, hold on a second. Who are the who are the teams that even beaten Alabama twice? Ole Miss, it's LSU. It's not South Carolina. It's not Kentucky. It's not anywhere from the East. Um, Auburn. Auburn's only other one. Yeah, Auburn would be the only other one. And I, was Auburn ever? Well, could have been. Well, you said the SEC opponent, or was it? Could he didn't go, say SEC. Could, I didn't see. It. I didn't say SEC. No, but they beat them twice. Them. <laughs> that would also be Clemson. I, you know what? Um, I'm going to go with. I, actually, I'm going to go with Auburn because I, I don't feel like the old. I don't feel like the Ole Miss games, other than the two that they lost. I don't think the next one was even close, if I remember right. So I'm going to go with Auburn, but I don't think it's. I don't think it's that one either. That is incorrect. I think the key hint is this team has beaten Alabama more than once since Saban has taken over. CD with the steal. What do you got? It'll be Ole Miss. And that game was iconic. If you remember correctly, that was the game I believe Eddie Jackson got hurt in, but he had a punt return at the end of the first half. They were down by 20 points, I believe. And J- that was Jalen Hurts' true freshman year. He came back and brought him to win that game. I think they had a strip sack in the, the end zone. A Jonathan Allen might have caused two. Uh, but yeah, that was that that was that crazy play. He had a, he had a scoop and score or like an interception thing where he like he went like sixty yards and almost, like it was he was a superstar that year on the defensive side. Yeah, it was it was Ole Miss. It was not Ole Miss in that game. Now Jonathan Williams had or Jonathan Allen had an interception return for a touchdown against Mississippi State. Dak Prescott's Mississippi State. That's the big game that you're thinking of. Remember, he took over that big game against Dak Prescott. Oh yeah, but so, it was Miss, right? it was Ole Miss. It was not Ole Miss. It was Texas A and M. Trevor Knight, the guy he leaped over was Trevion Williams, A and M single season rushing oh. leader all time. Oh, they you beat him twice. They did beat them twice because oh. they both oh. beat them once, and then you're so right. You know, my my second hint, Papa Doss, was you watched one of these losses to a backup quarterback live in one of the greatest college football atmospheres <laughs> of all time. Yes. yes. <laughs> Just wow, quick. so no one gets points there. That's crazy. I I thought what's crazy is I can like close my eyes and I can watch that play exactly happen because you've seen it a hundred times on ESPN, like highlights. Yeah, see, I remember it being a maroon. T- I thought it was Mississippi State, and I'm like, who was th-? I was like, I was trying to remember, I was like, what? And I was like, oh my god, it was against Texas State that wasn't it? And I was like, geez. And I was trying to remember who was quarterback then, and it turns out it was Trevor Knight. So it's pretty crazy. But anyways. So no no points there. No points there. Which I'm surprised by because you guys had three guesses to guess four teams. <laughs> so the one we forget was like two of the most iconic games of Saban's history was like the two Texas AM games, one loss and then the, the one the following year. Yep. So, anyways, next question, eighth question. Three more to go. Antonio Langham is Alabama's all time leader in interceptions with 19. However, this three-time national champion and second-team All-SEC safety from Alabama had 14 interceptions in his career, which leads all players in the Nick Saban era, era, including eight in one season, which is more than Langham ever had. Well, with one of, with one of two players, I'm thinking. Um, I mean, Landon Collins comes to mind, and so does um, 
Dre Kirkpatrick, but so does make up Fitzpatrick. Uh, oh, he said safety. So, uh, but Fitzpatrick's not a safety either. Um, I'm just going to go Landon Collins and not waste a um, not waste a, a, a possible hint. And that is incorrect. Landon Collins did not have eight interceptions or fourteen in his career. He actually did not have a ton of interceptions. In his career, he said he think. won three national championships in his tenure. He has three rings. That should, be, that should be a huge hint, by the way. Yeah. So we had to have lined up in the McCarran era. To, yeah, that's got to be in that. I think I know who it is. Fold. This guy's awesome. I used to love this guy growing up. I'm going to need a hint. I'm going I'm to have to go off and, and get a hint here. So he is from Foley, Alabama, and his eight interception season happened in 2010, playing opposite of Mark Barron. Dude, I know, who, dude. He had two picks against Penn State, and yep. I know, I know exactly who you're talking about. Oh my gosh! And this this is a forgotten name, by the way, and one of the better safeties in Nick Saban's tenure. He was not very fast either. He just has a ball hawk. It's not Vinny Sinceri. <laughs> oh, it's actually. Not, I was trying to. I, that was. I was about to throw out Vinny Sinceri. Vin, Dino since is Dino right? His father. Shout out that it's, family. Oh my gosh! I. Yeah, this is a great question. I think this is a tough one. I can't even remember who was opposite Mark Barron. Oh, I'm trying to think in of that the, era because they like yeah they had one year where they they crossed over Ha Ha Clinton Dix and Landon Collins, but every year you have a stud safety and then you have the second guy. And he's. Right. Do you guys need a second hint? Yeah, yeah, I gotta take a second hint. Yeah, why not? He played on the the 2010 season where he had eight interceptions, right? <laughs> The defensive backs were strong safety was Mark Barron. One side was Drake Kirkpatrick. And then the other side was a young D Milner. Yeah. And he wore the number 37. I know it. I know it. I know it. I, know it. I, <laughs> I, I knew you'd get that. I knew you'd get that. Let's see. This is, I think, one of the most underrated players in the saving era. Yeah. I, you know, I, I'm ashamed to say I'm, I'm, I'm blanking. I mean, I got I to gotta turn it over to CD here. I, I, I... All right. So, so my. The name that kept coming to my head before you said 37 was Nick Perry, and it's not Nick Perry. It's Robert Lester. Yes, it is Robert Lester. Had 14 interceptions in his career. Just a ball hawk. Just a ball hawk. He, he only ran a 4-6-40 at the, the combine, so that kind of tanked his draft stock there. But he's a good player nonetheless at Alabama. So definitely good. So CD gets a big steal right there, which puts him within four points – which within four points. So, because uh, you guys seven. didn't get the last question, Papa Doss is at 11, CD is at seven. So, there's two questions left. So, CD could still win this if Papa Doss does not get this one. I think this is, by the way, I think this question, this next question is the hardest one on this entire trivia because I had to, I remember the guy, but I had to look up the name. That's fun fact. The 2011 2012 season included Bama's top three wide receivers being. Marquise Mays, Darius Hanks, and Kenny Bell. I'm sure all names you remember, Dad. But this seemingly out of nowhere oh, wide receiver. Oh, this is easy. Had the is it easy? The most yards with 78 on four receptions in the 2012 national championship game against LSU after only having 112 yards on seven receptions for the entire regular season. Name that player. Okay, so th this guy had 78 yards against LSU. Led the game in receiving yards. Oh, in the national title game. In the oh, national title game. Little man Tyron Matthew, that whole game. Oh, oh, and I actually would have guessed Marquise Mays. Um, he only had 112 yards for the whole season going into that game. He only had seven receptions going into that game for the whole season. And then he just exactly. came out of nowhere in the national championship game and just played out of his mind. He, he had a good couple – he had a good year or two after that. Yeah. Not great. He, he didn't win MVP, though, because that was Trent Richardson. I can still picture the bootleg with McCarron getting him out of the pocket. And that so catch – On the other side. Yeah. And they did a toe tap. Yeah, that was awesome. I mean, I, was it Norwood? I – I just said his name. <laughs> said his name, so I'm going to – it had to be Norwood. What was his first name? What is his first name? Oh, shoot. 
I do not, I don't remember his first name. No way I remember his first name. Um, it was a four star out of high school. It's actually pretty good coming out of high school. So it's not like he was out of nowhere, but he felt like he was out of nowhere. I mean, if you actually listen to McCarron and uh, Kubelik in the morning, or uh, McElroy and Kubelik in the morning, McElroy talks about this guy a lot, actually, as uh, one of his he, favorite guys. He's a, he's a captain for like three years on that team. Talked about him as one really? of his favorite teammates and uh, a guy, yeah. just a stand-up guy. Stand-up, um, stand-up guy. He was drafted, I believe, to the Steelers. Don't quote me on that. But I don't remember. That's, I kind of just made that up. So CD can steal the first, the first, get the first name. I'll take Kevin Norwood and... Kevin Norwood for 500 was dead. If you just ask for hints, my second hint was his first name is shared with a certain king of queens. <laughs> <laughs> so now we are coming down the, the, the okay, so I got a one point lead. Last question. Last question. This one's good. This one might hurt, Dad, but also, well, it's not actually going to hurt. It just has to do with kickers. <laughs> oh, Lord. So oh, Alabama has been notorious for having kickers just costing them games. But can you name the kicker at Alabama with the most national championship rings? Kicker with the most national championship rings. What Is it I- in the Saban era? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. These are all Saban era questions. I mean... It's got it. It can't be someone who has more than two. So it's nobody recent, right? Because they haven't done. Well, it it could in theory be whoever was twenty eight, eighteen, and twenty twenty, right? Yeah, I guess so. Um, but no, the twenty twenty kicker. Uh, yeah, the, right. He was he not twenty eighteen, and yeah, he he. Well, although he. Yeah, he was a, he was a true saw. He yeah. wouldn't have gotten a ring from 2018, no. So you have to go you go backwards from there. Um, I tell you, what it is it's probably someone who should probably give that ring back. <laughs> if you go back from Riker, I think you end up with kickers who didn't necessarily weren't that good. In well, less, that'll says, be a hint later. Unless it's it's the 2009, uh, 2009, 2011. The 2009 kicker was a senior on that team. And that's when the problem started was after. Right, but the question is like how many rings, right? This person could have been on that roster still. I guess you're right. I got, I got, to, I got to take a hint, yeah. Okay. He is also the second all-time leader in career field goal percentage for that. So I should tell you about something about him. And he has three national championships. I know my rings. Guy. Three national championship rings. Okay, so it's got to be who the who the heck was the kicker through those McCarran years? Well, remember that LSU game? Yikes! <laughs> well, that's why I'm saying he should, <laughs> should 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 give the freaking ring back at least one of them. Um, I I got to be honest with you guys. I have blocked out the names of almost every kicker at Alabama since Michael Proctor, and um, yeah, I it's been such a train wreck. Other than the 2020 season, okay. Yeah, okay. I understand. I understand. You got to kick it over to CD and let him win this thing, I think. Well, the problem is, is I'm down to two players, and it's either going to be Cade Foster or Jeremy Shelley, right? So I knew who I would take between those two. I, Shelley was the better kicker because I, I think his field goal percentage is higher. That's why I'm going to go with Jeremy Shelley. That is correct. He oh, was on that 2019. Was- Cade Foster came in 2010. Fun okay. fact. Jeremy he Shelley. Was he was a linebacker that played kicker and he couldn't kick the ball. Kate Foster, 56% field goal percentage for his career. Yikes. Jeremy Shelley. You're, you're talking about kickers. So, yes, none of them have been good, particularly good. Obviously, we had a great year in 2020. That same kicker, that same kicker, though, I believe it's the same kicker. This is why I'm, I'm so bad on the names. Missed the Tennessee field goal last year. That, yeah. that, I probably has Alabama playing back again in the national championship or at least playing in the SEC title game against Georgia. And let's not even go down the path of kick six. 
So you're, you're, you're really, anytime you bring up place kicking to an Alabama football fan, you're really, you're going to, you're going to have their stomach turn, honestly, going back uh, anything after Michael Proctor, who was the 90-92, who, by the way, uh, interesting fun fact, Michael Proctor was buddies with, uh, very good buddies with Dabo Sweeney off of that team. And Michael Proctor um, was a uh, brother of a training brother of mine. Wow. The more you know. The more you know. What's crazy is also you forget the Auburn game in 2019, right? When when Tua got hurt and Matt Jones came in and played well, Joseph Bulavis, who was the backup kicker that year because Will Riker got hurt, botched a, a, a freebie kick after Matt Jones drove. I mean, well, and also let's not also remember that same game, I believe, was uh, the field goal attempt that never should have happened for Auburn because they they grounded the ball and, you're, and you the, need the clock seconds. absolutely should have expired. Well, you need two seconds to, to ground and, it or whatever. And it they is. didn't have and, – and, and so that also was the diff, you know, point differential anyway in that game. So, Alec, kicking is not – We've got running backs. We've got wide receivers. In recent years, we've got quarterbacks, uh, you know, uh, but linebackers, obviously, linemen. I don't know what's going on with our kicking game, but it's 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 just we can't get it. So a name drop I need to throw in there is Andy Papanastos or Pap- Papanan. Yep, Papanastos. The guy that botched the, the, the Georgia national title game when they had a chance to win in regulation, Tua drove him down. Oh, yeah. And he kicked the ball sideways. I mean, <laughs> Yikes. Yeah, they ended up winning that game, so who cares? But if they lost that game, he would have been. Well, that was know. why Bama fans were devastated when the sack, the Tua took the sack. Because they had no chance. Because they, there's no, goal. there is no way you're kicking a field goal, even if you get, you know, another uh, good play after that, and you're talking about, you know, two more plays, you're fourth down. It would have been bad. Uh, so thank God Tua found, uh, found him in the end zone. Right, and Dad, the, the kicker that you're talking about that should give back his ring is Cade Foster. It was the guy that lost the LSU game 9-6 when he missed four field goals in that game. But then they ended up making it back to the national championship, and then that's when Jeremy Shelley like, finally like, kind of took the range. He was like – one of my hints was like that he played alongside Cade Foster, and he was the inside the 45 guy. Yeah. Just remember like how they used him both kind of, but Jeremy Shelley was the accurate guy. Um, yeah, he's second all-time. Will Riker is uh, number one field goal percentage all-time. Fun fact. That that actually makes sense. That makes sense. he actually has been a very the Tennessee you know miss notwithstanding he he's been a very 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 good kicker college yep. kicker like we unless it's uh the, the Carlson brothers against yeah. Alabama yeah <laughs> the Carlson yeah how does Auburn keep getting these kickers I out of nowhere and they've had three they've three uh, NFL kickers right now yeah crazy. Yeah, I mean, it is pretty crazy. Well, guys, so that's all we have time for today. Uh, thank you, Papa Doss, for joining us today. It's just a fun Alabama-themed episode. Uh, can't wait to keep talking more things. Sorry to get to a mailbag episode again today, but keep sending us those mailbags. We have a couple questions in the queue. That is theretroitsoft.com. gmail.com. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at, at theretroitsoft. It's at theretroitsoft. We're on YouTube. We're on Spotify. And uh, we're having a great time doing this. So, Keep liking, keep following, keep listening if you so choose. So thank okay. you guys so much. Pleasure Sorry? Being, pleasure being here. Thank you, boys. Yeah. Can we get thank the roll you. tide real quick. Oh, you can get a roll tide. Absolutely. And my prediction, bold prediction, Alabama will win the national championship this year. Roll Very tide few tide. Alabama fans are saying that. No one in the national media is saying that. I'm actually saying it. Oh, I'll say roll tide then. All right, well, I guess we're all tied until they come to College Station. All right, see you guys.